Okay, thank you so much for your kind introduction. So I think now you know about my book, Karl Marx's Eco-Socialism. Today I'm going to talk about something new, so no worries. <laughs> and in the last section, uh, people talk about the feasibility of the transition, but I think this section about is a more about uh, imagining utopia. Because I think one of the main importance of the humanities today in the Anthropocene is about, you know, regaining uh, new kinds of uh, utopia or imaginary because the capitalism became so obvious fact to us. But I think within the capitalism, we cannot really solve this problem of climate crisis. That's why we also need to imagine a much more radical, different kinds of future today. And also this is my love call to Degros people because I think uh, based on my new reading of Marx, was, you know, some Marxists uh, treated Degros people very badly, but I'm more uh, very friendly and uh, su supportive of the view of uh, Degros. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm gonna share my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, Since the time is quite limited, I go as fast as I can. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about climate crisis and ecological revolution. And I uh, deal with three different kinds of uh, imaginative uh, future vision. And I criticize two and I defend the last one, the eco-socialism basically. So uh, we are living in the Anthropocene. I think uh, Chakrabarty talked about it yesterday, so I'm not going into this. Uh, but the situation looks like the end of the future, as Bill McKibben argued. But this end of nature didn't realize any human domination over nature. Rather, what we are witnessing today is increasing uncontrollability of nature. And some people talk about actually the return of nature, the, extinction of species, desertification, super hurricane, soil erosion, these are problems that humans cannot really adequately solve. Uh, so after 30 years of the famous Fukuyama's uh, declaration about the end of history, what we are witnessing under this uh, celebration of global neoliberal capitalism is end of human civilization. So the whole point is we need much more radical vision, much more radical theoretical framework because I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about how fast we need to reduce the carbon dioxide because everyone knows about this. But the whole point is that it seems very unlikely that we can attain uh, zero carbon emission by 2050 with this uh, current pace of uh, economic growth. So that's why people are talking about system change, not climate change everywhere. But the point is, or the question is, what kind of system change do we want? That's what I'm going to talk about. One is, of course, green capitalism. People talk about Green New Deal everywhere, and I characterize Green New Deal as climate Keynesianism. I'm not free, I'm not free rejecting Green New Deal as such, but uh, I'm basically criticizing here uh, climate changeism, uh, the kind of Green New Deal uh, suggested by those supporters of the green capitalism. <clears throat> In this context, the pandemic is a very <clears throat> interesting case. Pandemic marks the end of the neoliberal austerity and the beginning of the new age of the fiscal stimulus. It's very surprising that even you know politicians and big corporations are welcoming uh, the government spending increase, and I think you know they, these people are talking about austerity for such a long time, but now they're talking about green investment a lot because this is a kind of welcome situation for many corporations. It opens up the new opportunities for huge investment to revive the real economy stagnating in the last 20 years, but now they can even get the support from the government. And uh, this is also the end of the financial capitalism. So pandemic creates the situation, this is, is characterized by two ends, the end of neoliberal austerity and the end of financial capitalism. 
So they are gonna go into using this Green New Deal policy, invest in solar panel, electric vehicles and whatsoever that they really need to rebuild the entire social infrastructure. So we, we are witnessing the opening up of new <clears throat> ways of uh, investing in the real economy. So they expect or they hope that this economic growth through the greening of the entire economy offer the possibility to attain the broader consensus, not just among the elites, but also from the lower and the middle class in the global north, creating new jobs, you know, the booming of the economy, rising uh, wages and rising demand, etc. But this is nothing but the formation of the new kind of the imperial Lebensweise, the imperial ways of living in the age of climate crisis, as Marx Wissen and Ulrich Blant once uh, discussed the imperial Lebensweise uh, after World War II, but this is a new stage in the climate crisis. It will only lead to the ecological imperialism, I assume, not just because of the myth of decoupling the Kallis and the Hickel, uh, convincingly demonstrated this is uh, we are not witnessing any absolute decoupling uh, in the current uh, growing system of economy but also the problem is that green capitalism is not fast enough uh, to tackle the climate crisis uh, especially because short-term profit is not compatible with long-term universal metabolism of nature but also the problem is that green new deal basically strengthens the ecological imperialism and unequal exchange of labor, resources, and environment, environmental damage. This is very characteristic to an imperial Lebensweise. The reducing uh, CO2 in the global north by building uh, solar panels or electric vehicles or whatsoever is realized only through intensive, much more intensive and extensive robbery of nature in the global south. And this tendency is already becoming apparent in the last few months in the rising price of lithium, the cobalt and nickel and the other kinds of rare art is this price is uh, going up because all the countries are now expecting uh, the huge demand in the future. So in this ecological imperialism, the capital accumulation can go on and on, but not a free and just sustainable development. So the economic crisis can be postponed success, successfully, but the ecological crisis becomes only worse and severe, and especially in the global south. So we need to challenge much more radically the green capitalism. I don't have time because I want to talk about Marx in, in the second half, so I'm not really uh, arguing in detail. But uh, some, many people like Carlis and Hickel already demonstrated uh, that uh, this kind of green new deal doesn't really work, only works for the global north. So I think in the Anthropocene, even though Chakrapaldi doesn't really want to talk about capitalism anymore in the Anthropocene, I'm, I'm not sure if he talked about capitalism yesterday, but, uh, but uh, he doesn't he doesn't talk about capitalism. But I think if really really want to solve this problem of climate crisis, we need to challenge capitalism. And that's why there is a growing interest in eco-socialism and big growth, and we are invited today as a speaker, I hope. And I think, so I'm, I'm basically defending the position of eco-socialism, but I also want to show that eco-socialism is quite compatible with the growth. And Marx's vision of eco-socialism is compatible with the growth too. However, as Zala just talked about in the introduction, Marxism is quite notorious for the Promethean vision of the uh, future. Prometheanism is basically about uh, absolute domination of nature uh, through technologies. And the problem, so what we have is the eco-socialism is not always green. It's rather brown, I would say. And I have been trying to demonstrate that eco-socialism is green and Marx himself was quite seriously interested in the problem of ecology. But against this, what I have been confronting in the last uh, few years is this defense 
the passionate defense of Prometheanism, even among the left. Ray Brassiel famously defended uh, the Prometheanism, and uh, he basically called for the reviving the Promethean idea as the central identity of Marxism. And there's a clear affinity between Marx and eco-modernism, like Breakthrough Institute, etc. And those people basically argue that Anthropocene already signals uh, too much intervention in nature, too much in human intervention. So we cannot retreat from this situation. Bruno Latour once famously called it the love you a monster, but it's basically, so it's basically about necessity of further human intervention or further control of nature for the sake of the survival of humanity, if not human emancipation. So some Marxists argue for the further usage of nuclear power plants, geoengineering or negative emission technologies. And they even criticize a uh, degrowth movement as a kind of folk politics. The folk politics basically means that it is local, small scale and minoritarian social movements that doesn't have any impact up on the global capitalism. We need to change, so says Srunicek, for example. We need to re really challenge uh, the global capitalism as a world system. So the folk politics is a very inadequate way of challenging this system, like Occupy movement didn't change anything, that's what they say. So the people like Aaron Bastani in his book, Fully Automated Luxury Communism, basically celebrates the new uh, technologies as the foundation of post-capitalism. They hope that the technological development under capitalism creates a post-scarcity future and it will ultimately blow capitalism sky high. That's what uh, that expression comes from the Gruntry said. But obviously Marx did not simply praise the capitalist development of productive forces as a progress of history, simply because of the fact that technology and the capitalism is not neutral at all. This is what he argues in Capital as the problem of productive forces of capital. The point is basically that productive forces of capital is about increasing productive forces for the sake of domination over workers and nature. The capitalist development of technologies is not just not about liberating workers from work. It's about disciplining them, controlling them, commanding over them. So it only reinforces the regime of capital. It only builds a further domination over workers. And Richard York and Brett Clark also argues that the capitalist technology as a productive forces of capital can only shift the metabolic lift, but it can never really repair it. That's the problem that what we just uh, witnessed in, the in my critique of the Green New Deal, right? It's, uh, it's just about Imperial Lebensweiser in the global north, but the problem is simply shifted to somewhere else and some other kind of people. But the problem of the rift remains all the time. So what I problematize, what I see in Bastani is the puberty of philosophy or puberty of imagination because Bastani can imagine a post-capitalist and a post-scarcity future only based on capitalist technologies such as EV and electric vehicles and solar panels and more artificial meat and asteroid mining, etc. But this is not the way that we should be uh, aiming at. Why? Oh, by the way, this is my new book, Das Kapital in Anthropocene. It just uh, appeared in uh, Japanese. Uh, basically, I'm arguing for like a degrowth communism. And, uh, but what I argued in this book, I'm uh, currently writing an English version of it, but uh, if I very roughly summarize, uh, but what, what we witness in Bastani is the persistence of capitalist realism. It is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. That's the capitalist realism. I'm calling for regaining much more radical post-capitalist imaginary because without such imagination, ecological revolution 
ends up simply demanding accelerating what already exists, such as basic income, modern monetary salary, Green New Deal, global tax, full automation, all the simply accelerating what already potentially exists. It's not really different from uh, what capitalism offers. That's my conviction. And that's also what your Zizek points out as a paradox of radical policies. Here's what he means. In order to realize the ideal kind of basic income, Green New Deal, or modern monetary theory, because you know, basic income could be utilized by more conservative people to cut social welfare, etc. So if we want to have a really emancipating kinds of uh, basic income or Green New Deal, the power of the social movement must be so strong, really strong, so strong that even we can overcome capitalism. Because otherwise, conservative people or like right-wing people simply dominate uh, the basic income and they use it uh, for other purposes. So if we, really, we really need to have a strong power to beat those enemies, one could say. But if we can beat enemies, why do we preserve capitalism? We can, if we can beat enemies, we should simply abolish uh, uh, capitalism as such. So the main contradiction is that they want to have some radical vision through radical policies like modern monetary salary or basic income whatsoever, but they want to conserve fundamental characteristics of capitalism, such as wage labor, market competition, endless economic growth, et cetera. So these are not very convincing way of imagining uh, utopia because utopia can be uh, more characterized by less work, more commons, more creative activities or whatsoever. But this is something that has been seriously marginalized and oppressed under the capitalist mode of production. And in order to bring up this kind of marginalized utopia back into the table again, I think it is also necessary to redefine abundance and scarcity. And this is why the humanities is very important because we can sort of have this new uh, definition of uh, these concepts and so that we can have a more, more non-productivist and post-scarcity society. And this is also conducted by recently by Benanaf in his critique of full automation. But in any case, I do this by going back to Marx. And the problem is that basically under capitalism, we can never have abundance. Capitalism is a system that is ultimately essentially characterized by scarcity because capitalism aims at endless growth, endless capital accumulation. So it is really, no matter how much they, it develops, it is always scarce. And capital also creates scarcity through commodification of the entire world. And this is what John Bellamy Foster problematizes as paradox of wealth or the Lauderdale paradox. Uh, it just, it's about how the increase of private wealth is fundamentally characterized by the decline or decrease of public wealth. Because if we remember, remember about the primitive accumulation, it's about dissolving the commons in order to create the private wealth. So from the beginning, capitalism, from the very beginning, capitalism characterized by this creation of artificial scarcity. That's the first negation of capitalism. Primitive accumulation is the beginning of this creation of artificial scarcity for the sake of increasing private riches. And Marx so consistently, quite consistently argued that the neg second negation, negation de negation, as the rehabilitation of the earth as commons. He says, but the capitalist production begets its own negation. This is the negation of the negation. It does not reestablish private property, but it does indeed establish individual property on the basis of the achievements of the capitalist era namely cooperation and the possession in common of the earth, the air, and the means of production produced by labor itself. So Marx is quite eco-socialist here, right? The earth, the air doesn't belong to anyone. It just, it must be uh, common. 
And I, when I read this, I realized that how uh, ecological Marx could be, and I started uh, doing research in his notebooks, and I realized more and more how his uh, engagement with uh, ecological issues was actually much deeper than other people previously assumed. And I showed this by editing the Marx and Gesamt Ausgabe, but I'm not going into detail of this, but anyway, Marx clearly regarded the rehabilitation of sustainable production as the central task of socialism. That's why I call his socialism as eco-socialism. And this is the view that Marx already developed in Capital, Volume 1, for example, in this passage here. But the problem is that there, is, there are some passages that seem uh, kind of contradictory. And the one passage is this one in Critique the Gotha Program, written in 1871, so after Capital. Here, he seems quite Promethean. He says, in the, this famous passage, in a higher phase, higher phase of communist society, after the productive forces have also increased with the all round human development and all the spring of commonwealth, the Genossenschaftlicher Leichtung, flow more abundantly, only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety and the society inscribed on its banners, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. So <laughs> he's saying about how the wealth flow more abundantly and then people can consume a lot. And that's why people uh, like Harman Daly, uh, the famous economist of the steady state economy, criticized uh, this passage. He says, you know, how uh, Marx is about determinist and economic growth is always crucial in order to have abundance, etc. But it does make sense. Right, because if Cap Marx was already ecological in Capital Volume 1 written in 1867, why was he so naive in 1871? And I think one uh, important hint is this expression, the abundance of Genossenschaftliche Leistung. So it's not about abundance of private wealth. He says, we need to overcome the narrow horizon of bourgeois right. If we want to have the abundance of material wealth, if we want to have more and more of what we in, as individual can consume, we are still trapped in the narrow bourgeois horizon. But we need to overcome this, what, this is what he says. And then we have the true abundance uh, of wealth as Genossenschaftliche Leistung, the common wealth. And this is very interesting, actually. If you read in this way, Marx is basically talking about, in a consistent from this negation, the negation, rehabilitating the common wealth. And that's the foundation of the abundant society. The post scarcity society is about rehabilitating this abundance of Genossenschaftliche Leistung. Not consumptionist material goods. So I want to say that the abundance of the Genossenschaftliche Leistung is not equivalent to the unlimited access to abundant goods. Otherwise, communist society would simply repeat the same form of private riches as capitalism. Since primitive accumulation created artificial scarcity, communism reverses the order with the aim of recovering the radical abundance of the common commonwealth, making it equally accessible to everyone at the cost of private wealth. So I'm running out of time, so I'm going to the, my conclusion is basically, so capitalism, oh, no, no, the Marx eco-socialism is characterized in the following way. It is based on Marx's insight or conviction that capitalism is a system with perpetual scarcity due to its drive for unlimited capital accumulation. It can never end. It needs more and more and it creates abundance, but it's always characterized by scarcity. So they want more. That's how we are now facing in this climate crisis. 
And against this uh, unlimited growth, Marx was basically arguing for rehabilitating the abundance of common wealth, abundance of wealth through commonification. That's the Genossen Schaffischerleistung in that passage of critique uh, of Gotak program. And increasing commons and reducing work time and increasing time for non consumption activities, such as art, sport, sex, or caring whatsoever, as well as decreasing the environmental damage is quite, can be quite central to Marx's own eco-socialism. That's my point. Of course, eco-socialism can simply say so, but also Marx's own view was quite compatible with this. And although Kate Soper in her recent book criticized Marxism, um, but I think what she suggests as alternative hedonism is quite compatible with my own reading of Marx's text. And this is really the new culture of this is a topic of our section. So the system is changing and the new culture emerges or the transformation of the system must be accompanied by the creation of new values, the new culture, because otherwise we end up uh, with producing more and more. And that's why I want to say, I want to highlight that eco-socialism without growth, this is what Kali said, is quite compatible with Marx's own vision of post-scarcity societies. And it is precisely a radical alternative to capitalist abundance in the age of climate crisis. Thank you so much. <laughs>